Um, so what we're going to talk about and who am I? I'm Hakan, have been a software slash data engineer for the last six, seven years and right now CTO of Datacater. We will first talk about the problem description, why am I even having this talk, then taking cloud native principles, apply them to ETL and where we believe the way is forward for ETL, and then some code snippets on what actually an ETL pipeline running in a cloud native environment, in this case, uh, Kubernetes would look like. So basically the software industry has gone from dev and ops to a culture of DevOps in the sense of you build it, you run it. Um, we often heard we shift the responsibility left, but we provide the tools to actually operate the things that we build ourselves. And from that, one of the mechanisms that came about is GitOps. So infrastructure as code, something changes in your deployable branches, you push it into one of your stages. This doesn't really exist for ETL. We are seeing spark operators and these kinds of things so we are getting there but i think or we believe that there is more to be done to actually get there um, etl tooling right now severely different differs by stage so dev looks completely different than test and prod because mostly the data loads are quite different and then also the content sample data might be very different so there's no real GitOps possible today. Um, scalability has to be in the same code base, so scalability properties has to be have to be in the same code base as your business logic. So in a Spark job, you need to take care of how you can parallelize and uh, how you want to parallelize wide versus narrow transformations. And what happens is you have people operating your Kubernetes class, uh, your Spark cluster, for example, on Kubernetes, they write their manifests, but it doesn't kind of come together with your Spark code base. So just to be clear, whenever I talk about ETL or data pipelines, in a nutshell, this is it. So we have different data sources and often what we want to see or what we see in the world is we want to put it into a data warehouse or an analytics database, maybe put it into another application database to provide a REST API. This is one of the most common things we see right now. Let's talk CI CD and what GitOps actually is. So we have these stages. For us, we use GitHub. So we have GitHub Actions for building, testing, merging things to our deployable branch and then releasing artifacts. We use Argo CD to use these artifacts in our Kubernetes manifests to actually deploy them to our production cluster or staging cluster. With this whole picture, there is one major question. Where is the state? Where is my code? What state is my Kubernetes cluster in? And uh, do I actually have the artifacts that I need for deployment? So looking at this, we can see that for build, test, and merge, everything usually is in your source control management system. So for us, again, it's GitHub. So there you have your code, and usually your CI pipeline pushes something like a tag, or it fixes a hash where you know, OK, my release artifact was built by this hash exactly on Git. So the state for this whole workflow for all the compute in CI, CD is in your source control management. Your state for your artifacts is in your artifact registry. It could be any cloud provider or JFrog. And when you deploy artifacts, um, tools like Argo CD, they actually put metadata onto your Kubernetes resources and then exchange information and see, okay, when was the last update? Which Git hash did I use for that? And do I need to upgrade everything or only partial part or only parts of the system? So state is completely externalized. So 
I think this is quite suitable for ETL as well. And um, basically, I'm here to gain allies. <laughs> um, so some cloud native principles. We try to, what we also saw just now with Kafka streams, we try to have scalable applications which can be auto scaled, for example, with a horizontal pod auto scaler in Kubernetes. What is great for ETL is image immutability because if you apply transformations, especially if you are in a regulated environment, you want to be sure that you can tell the regulator, this is the process at time X, Y, Z, transform my data and that's why my model resulted as it did. And what would be great is if we can put it into a declarative description. Yeah, uh, YAML is our enemy and friend in, in the cloud native world and um, a very simple pipeline that we envision would be like having a couple of filters and then your transformation steps described. Um, and ideally, what you would like to have is some sort of way to have user-defined transformations. Yeah. So how do we get there? Um, one way would be to externalize your state to an event streaming system like Apache Kafka. There are multiple out there right now that have Kafka compatible API. So we can actually kind of take the same approach with this as CICD does. With event streaming, one of the biggest advantages we get for ETL is we can actually store, once we acknowledge a message, we can store the so-called offset in Apache Kafka. So even if we fail, we know where to pick up the process again. And ideally, you only declare your computations and your pipeline immediately knows where it left off when it failed or restarted because all the state is in Apache Kafka. So what we think where cloud native ETL is going is having multiple front ends. This might be a YAML, an API, a UI on top of that, then some sort of pipeline compiler. Uh, could be data gator, but uh, we see others emerging as well. And what then happens is what falls out is, for example, a Kafka Streams app, but could be also MQTT or AQMP. And currently, we also see Kinesis and Google PubSub implementing, especially Google PubSub, implementing the Kafka API. So bring your own streaming or event streaming system, I would say, there. So that basically what you would do now is uh, wherever your Kafka runs or event streaming system, you can now build, test, merge your um, ETL pipeline and release your pipeline images to a container registry and your externalized state to what you already have transformed or aggregated, it stays in your event streaming. And the advantage here is that by doing event streaming, you kind of have more predictable load and you have the same code base in testing and on your local machine as you would have in production. So how does it look practically? So we kind of do YAML apply, compile to a, in our case, Java Quarkus app, which kind of abstracts away um, certain parts of streaming implementations like Kafka Streams. It uses a library called SmallRy. And then we use JIP to build container images. Do you know what JIP is? Ever heard of it? OK, we have two thumbs up from one person. That's great. Um, so JIP basically allows you, within Java code, it's a library written by the GCP folks, within Java code to build container images of a base image. So we'll see how that works. You basically do a Docker build within Java code without having a Docker daemon or anything like that. So in practical terms, 
um, this uh, YAML pipeline and what should come out in the end is we have a Kafka topic that goes in, a data pipeline that falls out of this YAML and a Kafka topic for writing out to. This is the Java code, <laughs> quite simple. Looks similar to what we've seen with the Kafka Streams applications, but um, I want to bring your attention to the method signature of basic pipe. Um, so the annotations are basically small write annotations where you say, hey, I have two channels. They abstract away the topic. Then you say, I have a source topic and a sync topic. And the return type is a multi, which includes if this um, applicate or if the content of the method is successful, it will go back to Kafka in this case and say, hey, I've successfully processed your message. You can now mark the offset and increase that uh, or increase the offset so that I can tell Kafka, hey, uh, I don't want to reprocess this again. If this fails, um, we usually write to a dead letter queue, but you are sure that you will reprocess this message that failed again at a later point in time, depending on if you want that or not. So, um, what is great about Quarkus for us is with Kafka Streams, uh, in the talk we just saw that you could use test containers to spin it up a Kafka cluster. It is handy, <laughs> but uh, for us Red Panda works way better. It's a C++ implementation basically of uh, Kafka compatible technology. And what they do is they, this is spin up in dev mode is way faster because it's a binary. And second of all, um, you have not the broke uh, reassignment of IPs, which Kafka does. So you could even in dev mode easily go to uh, two nodes and it can rebalance the traffic there. And if you've never used Quarkus, give it a try. Um, not a huge Java fan, but everything you get in the dev UI is just amazing from like method profiling to test coverage, everything is in there. You can also look into your Swagger UI that comes out of it uh, if you have a REST interface. Yeah, give it a try. So now we go to JIP. Um, as you can see, this code snippet was prepared for another conference. Um, so basically, what we said before is we can give an exact name or hash to a container image. And every time our pipeline changes or transformations and filters, we could, so the numbers, the pipeline ID and pipeline revision would increase, but you also have your container hash, which is uniquely identifiable. Um, and we basically always work with two registries because we have the pipeline base image of the Kafka Streams application implementing the best practices that we just saw. And then um, we, have the customer registry where we need to log in to put the pipeline registry uh, pipeline image into there so that they can run it on their clusters. Um, with JIP, what is actually very nice is you they have um, event-based logging, so you can have multiple you can attach multiple handlers and log this to different systems that you need to. And the last snippets starting from jib.from is basically, I take my base image, let's say uh, Nginx, it goes to Docker Hub, and then I just say add layer, which just basically copies in your done artifact. In this case, this will be the application that we just saw in Java, but now compiled. And if you compile uh, with Quarkus, you can get a binary from that Java, and we uh, basically call the start command and start running this um, pipeline. If you use JIP, what I would highly recommend is, just need to check something, okay. What I would highly recommend is whenever you start it on a node, so on startup of your application, pull the base image. 
so that it's cached and your customers don't need to wait that you initially pull the base image. Um, you have multiple mechanisms of authentication. What you do not have is a basic uh, attachment of Kubernetes secrets. So you basically, that, that's actually quite non-intuitive as it is meant for running in Kubernetes. So what you always have to do is go to a Kubernetes secret, pull it yourself, get the username and password out of there, and also um, try not to use Kubernetes secrets because they are just base64 encoded. So go to your vault that you need and then pull the secrets from there. Yeah, and the detailed logging and granular logging events, they are quite helpful when something goes wrong in building that image. So, where we are at right now when we look into the ecosystem that we are using to get closer to this um, cloud native ETL pipelines, to these net cloud native ETL pipelines. Um, we need stronger self containment in, in the sense of right now, if you submit a Spark job, it doesn't tell you which resources it will need that's highly dependent on the data peaks that you will encounter. But if we go towards a more Kubernetes approach where each resource says, hey, these are my limits in terms of memory and CPU, we can self-contain our process on a given node or multiple nodes, depending on scalability properties. Um, so most of the tools that we use right now is they are actually pre-version one, like whether it's JIB or um, some parts of small RI, they actually run in production everywhere, but they are pre -ver version pre one, also Red Panda. Um, but I think the ecosystem is getting better to work and uh, quite happy about, especially Red Panda and small RI here. Um, what would be great in the future is to kind of have a sense of what a declarative data pipeline would be. I mean, we have our implementation, there are others implementing it differently, but I think um, there is a place to have, like the Kafka API, to say, okay, this is the way we should declare filters and transformations on data. Um, but what we can do already is reap the benefits thanks to the guys behind Apache Kafka and Red Panda. We have a great dev ecosystem around Java Quarkus and especially MicroProfile and um, SmallWrite doing a great job there when it comes to messaging and streaming. And um, usually this, talks in, this talk includes a run through Streamz, which I don't have, a time for, uh, have the time for today. So Streamz allows you to quite easily operate Kafka and Kafka Connect clusters in on top of Kubernetes. Thanks, and I think we are roughly at the 20 minute mark, right? Okay, then we might have time for the excursion to Streamz, unless you want to have drinks. Now I'm asking the audience, drinks or Streamz and Kafka? Drinks? No, Kafka? Okay. I might have to close the presentation for a bit. Sorry for that. So, let me quickly do this. Apologies. So, um, I guess we already know what Kafka is, so event messaging. Do we know what Kafka Connect is? Yes, no, no, yes, okay, it's a yes, no. So Kafka Connect basically connects to a database and fills your Kafka topics. What Streamzy allows us to do here is, and that's quite handy, and with the way a lot of people work nowadays in Kubernetes is, it provides you CRDs 
for creating Kafka clusters and Kafka Connect clusters. So you first install the cluster operator we are with the CRDs, and then it checks the, these resources, the custom resources defined, and creates a Kafka Connect cluster and the Kafka cluster that we can see on the right-hand side. For now, it also has to create a Zookeeper cluster for um, distributed configuration. Since Apache Kafka 3, it's obsolete, but Apache Kafka does not recommend to run their own protocol called Craft in production yet. So you can go for it. StreamZ doesn't, so it still installs the Zookeeper cluster. And what connectors do is basically exchange, like you see, from data source to Kafka cluster and then um, takes from the sync topic and goes to a Kafka cluster again. Everything that has a blue is within the blue box that's basically um, managed by StreamZ. And in this context, basically our data pipeline that we just created before is um, now in the context of databases. So this would have been, could have been our sales DB and that could have been our BigQuery on the right hand side, the data sync. Um, Kafka Connect and self-containment, that's a huge issue. Because Kafka Connect often is deployed into the same cluster. And what this leads to is there are a lot of connectors that are not written by yourself, so exception handling leads to um, flushing a lot of log messages and exceptions to that same node, which has a peak in CPU. And even if you then provide resource limits, most of the implementation of the connectors have the problem that they will crash again, 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 until someone manually checks something. And that's actually quite bad for self-containment. Uh, did I not unskip the other ones? So what we started doing here, oh, sorry. So what we started doing in terms of self-containment here is now we moved the connectors out of the cluster or out of uh, the management from StreamZ, put them into um, single instances and single node mode, what you can do, and put them as sidecars into the pipeline. So Whenever one of them fails, your data pipeline actually has more insights and now your data pipelines get um, isolated because before that, every connector for each pipeline was running on the same Kafka Connect cluster. And that's very important for the approach of self-containment um, so that a data pipeline is reproducible when through all stages and it's self-contained like an application would be. With that being said, we can now go to questions because the rest will then take 20 minutes. <laughs> Perfect. Um, thanks, Hakan, for the presentation. <laughs> and now we have um, quite some time for questions. Who wants to go first? Hi, thanks Hi. for the presentation. And my question is, uh, you mentioned about the Jeep library. Does it also uh, suitable, usable with Scala? Yeah, it's actually, um, so the small right and, so Jeep is usable with Scala. You have to, um, only for the log handling, you need to exchange, I think they are called consumers and producers. So they are not natively implemented in Scala, so you need Java conversions, and depending on whether you use Scala 2.12 or 2.13, there's a different way of handling the logs in JIP. So it's suitable. Log handling is a bit tougher, depending on the Scala version you use. 
Any other question? So while people think maybe I can ask a question. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so you presented this um, vision about, um, let's say, moving to cloud native ETL. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, as far as I understood, you want this declarative way of um, describing ETL pipelines. Yeah. And therefore, you're proposing this, let's say, YAML um, file. So to what so what what expressiveness um, do you imagine in there i mean what have you done up to now and, and what's your plan for that so we have a couple of no code transformations but the vision should be rather a description of what steps should be taken and what we also think is you should so most of the data people work in python um that's why we started this because KSQL DB is also declarative, but once you want to implement user-defined functions, what happens is you need to write Java. A lot of the data science, data engineering people, so if all the talks you see around data science at Berlin Buzzwords is in Python. So we think the pipeline description for us now contains Python, or you could use Python, but the language itself, how you transform data, should not matter. You should be able to say, hey, I want to transform this, and this is a user-defined function, and then plug and play a container based upon that. That's totally fine. Um, but for now, we have roughly 50 no-code transformations that you can directly use in the YAML. We do discover though that it's way better for our customers to um, actually have the liberty to say, okay, this is the transformation and this is its execution. So to have less of a restriction in terms of we don't want to define a language for a new, lang a new SQL, so to say. This is not what we want. It's more about flexibility and having the ability to have one description which then always produces the same pipeline. I see. And maybe one last um, question from my side. So when comparing it, let's say, to a scheduler, mm -hmm. um, your uh, proposal here is, let's say, scheduling of operations plus infrastructure somehow. Um, do yeah, I get exactly. it right? Yeah. So it's basically instead of, um, like in the CI-CD example, in my CI CD pipelines, for example, in GitHub Actions, what I describe is how to build it, but I never like describe the content of my code, which is the state. And it, what we propose is the same thing can be applied to data that you focus on the computations and externalize every state to data. Of course, you need some sort of, as you can see, it's also an evolution. Um, so here on the left hand side, we started out with defining source schemas and we deviated from that because, um, for example, whether you use Kafka or any other database, schemas change over time and your code will change too. And if you now lock somehow your infrastructure onto that schema, now there's a third thing you need to manage. So we rather fail on execution instead of saying okay now i need to go into my schema registry change my schema there until my pipeline works again it can also work this way still without the extra information or the information that is lacking yeah. does that make sense yeah thanks okay. um so if there are no other questions um let's thanks let's thank hakan again <laughs>